at Crown Burgundy right now. Mascara was a bad idea. <laughs> um, some of you might not. I'm Jake's wife, Mary Catherine. Um, I had to put the water down. Uh, some of you may not know that I am a, a tiny bit older than Jake. I was born in April of 1980, uh, which ironically makes me a Carter baby and Jake a Ruby. <laughs> Always a little jealous. <laughs> uh, this is going to start off very hashtag this town, so just get ready. Um, I know that many people saw Jake and me as right and left, as red and blue, um, and it was certainly part of who we were. Um, but one of the things I've thought about uh, while talking to reporters and, and that's always part of the story that they want to ask about, which is natural, um, especially in hashtag this town. But what I want to, what I cautioned all of them is that we were not together despite this. We weren't, we weren't together because it was a cute branding opportunity. <laughs> um, we were together because both of us were so much more than that and believed that everyone is so much more than that. And I told someone, you know, Jake was not special because he was in the White House. He was in the White House because he was special. And I think... <laughs> I think hashtag this town can get a little too self-absorbed and like, and into just politics, when it's just so much more than that. And that's what makes life beautiful. And I think a, a fun example of that is on, on Thursday night, uh, I had this huge long day Thursday, and I, I ended up speaking at an event in the evening for Constitution Day at the archive, the National Archives. Um, and it was called Young Madisons, Why a New Generation is Standing Up for the Constitution. It was about millennials and the Constitution. And I spoke there, and then I came home where Jake had taken care of Georgia for the night. And we're very busy, and my calendar is not always greatly updated, as his is perfectly updated. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't know what I was doing that night, he just knew I had a thing. So I came home, and he asked what I had been up to, and I told him, and he said, oh, that's the event I skipped so I could come home and take care of Georgia. <laughs> Well, I was pretty good. <laughs> but I think that kind of event, actually at the event I referred to him, I, I said, you know, we were talking about how you, how you bring young people in and how you make government better and how you make democracy better. And I, I referred to him while I was speaking and said, you know, my husband works on this kind of stuff. He does this every day. Um, and he is the West Wing to my house of cards. <laughs> Never a cynic, always positive, and I'm being a little too hard on myself. Um, I am also a, a positive person of a sunny disposition, but a little more skeptical than one day <laughs> Um But I think that's what brought us together, is that we do care about the world, and we do care about the country, and yes, we have different conclusions sometimes, but it all starts with a respect for those that think differently, an assumption that they are coming from a place of good faith, and a willingness to work on talking to them, even when it's hard. And he did that all the time. Um, in talking to people about him this week, I have realized, and I already knew, but Jake Brewer was all the things, right? <laughs> so trying to explain to somebody how great he was would take like a really long time. Uh, not super quotable. Um, I will say he was all the things except for a cook. <laughs> <laughs> Got married one morning. I was like, you know, we're 
being domestic, I'm gonna like clean the bathroom or something. And I said, baby, can you just like make me an egg while I take care of this chore? And then we'll like have some breakfast. And he looked at me with this mixture of fear <laughs> and apprehension that I had never seen in his eyes before. <laughs> Including during labor when he was like an incredible coach. So there, there is that one thing. <laughs> you can all feel good about that. <laughs> he, was, he was equally at home at a Mule Day parade in Columbia, Tennessee. <laughs> or at a White House State Center. Right? You can't find many people who have that kind of range. Uh, he was good looking and athletic and had perfectly distributed facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> but he was also a total nerd who just nights ago over dinner uh, was talking about the cognitive development of his two-year-old. And the last conversation we had about his work, he was just so pumped about the presidential memo he had worked on about broadband regulation. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a reason when I dragged him into very complicated Halloween costumes, as I did every year. I would not say he was a super fan, but he acquiesced. There's a reason I dressed him up as Captain America. And I was like, that's believable. <laughs> He was a person who could have rested on his laurels long ago and done fine. Uh, he was a person who wouldn't have had to try, who wouldn't have had to be sweet all the time, who wouldn't have had to look into people's hearts and find the best of who they were. Our society would have let someone like him get away with that. And he was not content with that. He had so many gifts and he used every single one of them every day for other people because he knew that they were gifts and he knew he shouldn't waste them. He was um, damn near perfect, but he would be the first to tell you that he wasn't. And that's what made him try every day. Um, don't worry about it, I'm not going on a bad road here. <laughs> But because he would detest any moment of falseness in this discussion, like, we were not perfect. We have great pictures and a great life, and everything looks wonderful like it often does these days when you're just presenting that picture. We had moments when we were disconnected, never on the dance floor. <laughs> We had moments when the logistics of life and parenthood overtook any opportunity to talk about what we read that day, to get a little deeper. We had moments where we were traveling so much, I don't know when I saw him last. Um, there were moments when we had dumb political fights and dumb non-political fights. Some of those moments happened in the last month. And that's okay. This is part therapy for me and part for you guys. <laughs> that's okay. Because that's life. And living it every day requires doing the nuts and bolts. You can't always be, every second, the person that Jake Brewer sees in you, right? <laughs> and by the way, if any of you think like, oh my gosh, his wife is standing up there talking and she's telling jokes and that's crazy. I am standing here because I like a mic. <laughs> but two, because Jake Brewer believed in me. And because life has a way of being a balancing act, there were a thousand amazing things that happened this month. Improbable things. Uh, Jake and Georgia and I went to the lake, which is where we got married. And we are never there. 
just by ourselves. There's always a crowd of people. But there was some kind of miscommunication, and whoever was going to come for Labor Day didn't come for Labor Day. And so the three of us spent all weekend together in a place where we were married. And on um, the last night, sat on the deck together and had a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> Weak. And had a great talk as the sun set. And you guys will appreciate this. I actually was like, I need to Instagram these cocktails because they're really nice. I worked hard on them. And I take some pictures and he's like, that's not gonna cut it. <laughs> so he came over and framed one for me, helped me. Make it Instagram worthy. Um, he had that weekend with the guys. And I can't remember what was the scheduling thing that made that possible, but that was also improbable with Adam and Brad. And, um, on Friday night, he had dinner with his mom and his sister. And it was wonderful, just sitting and talking. Uh, on Friday morning, I flew out of town super early. And on Thursday night, I hadn't planned this. He's the one with the calendar. And I said, oh my god, I have to fly out super early tomorrow. Can you stay with Georgia until Norma and Annie gets here? And he said, looked at his calendar and said, oh, I don't have meetings tomorrow at 8. I can do that. This never happens. And so they got up that morning and hung out and had breakfast together before he went to work. Um, when we went to have an ultrasound for this baby, uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to know the gender. We did not know with Georgia. And uh, so I told the ultrasound tech, just put it in an envelope and we'll decide later. And by the time we got to the end of the ultrasound, the baby was not cooperative in a bad position. Uh, by the time we got to the end of the long ultrasound, she had forgotten what I told her. And she made sure I was looking away when she wrote on the screen what we're having. He was still looking. And I was looking at him. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and he has a very good poker face. <laughs> I was like, do you know now? And he said, yep. <laughs> and we being us, uh, I didn't bug him about it, and he didn't let anything slip. That was three weeks, a month ago. And what is truly wonderful about that is that forevermore, I will know, and his son or daughter will know, that he met them that day in that room in a way that none of us have met this one yet. And he got to know him or her for a month in his mind and come up with names and think about the future. Um, and what this all should be about is the future. Uh, my mission, and you'll have to really help me with this, uh, is to live unafraid and to live without sadness bogging me down. I don't want to hold my children so close because I'm afraid of one thing that happened on one day. I don't want to keep them from living the way their father did. And it'll be hard. Um, this is going to be ironic because saying this is really sad, but it's going to be a plea for, for no sadness. <laughs> I'm going to ask all of you who are our family, who are our community, and who we love so much, not to look on me and all of us in Georgia and this little one with sadness. Don't let us walk into a room and be a sad trombone. <laughs> we are not that. 
we are going to live the way he wanted us to live. Fast and furious. <laughs> We had just uh, started on the epic journey to watch all seven <laughs> Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious. <laughs> we had made it to five. And I promise you I will watch six and seven. <laughs> we also, in another uh, sort of perfectly complimentary moment, had the unorthodox opinion that we thought three was delightful. <laughs> Probably because that kid's accent kicks ass. <laughs> But I want to close with, um, as I said, I was at the Young Madison's event. And uh, as a result, I had been reading about Madison, and I went to Montpelier uh, as fellow mayor. It's one of my, one of my pastimes is to go to residential homesteads and libraries, like you do. Um, and Madison famously wrote a letter to his country before he died, called Advice to My Country. And the way he prefaced it is that his advice, because it came at that time, will be entitled, therefore, to whatever, excuse me, to whatever might can be derived from good intentions, and from the experience of one who has served his country in various stations through a period of years, who espoused in his youth and adhered through his life to the cause of its liberty, and who has borne a part in most of the great transactions which will constitute epochs of its destiny. Jake Brewer has not, quote unquote, written a letter of advice to this country. But I would suggest to you that his life and all of us and all that we will do moving forward and all that these kids will do moving forward are entitled to all of the things that Madison's advice is entitled to. They are worth listening to. He had much advice to give and we will follow it and I hope you will join me in praying that he has an awesome seat somewhere watching us and that he will be very proud of us every day. Thanks. <laughs>